Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. This is part three of working through the Bank Smarter Machine here on Hack Smarter. If you do not have a subscription to Hack Smarter, you are missing out. Make sure you grab one today before the price increases. Information can be found in the description of this video. All that being said, this is part three. So if you are watching this as your first video and you feel a little bit lost, well, that's sort of on purpose. Make sure you watch part one and part two before watching part three. The other thing you may notice is that there is chat right here and I make all of these videos while I'm live streaming. The reason for that is I try to make all of my content as accessible and as affordable for as many people as possible. And live streaming is a great way to do that. Now I live stream all the time. If you've never joined me for a live stream, make sure you subscribe over on my YouTube channel and hit the little bell notification so that you're notified the next time I am live. But let's go ahead and dive on in to the bank smarter machine. Let's do a quick recap. Let me drop, jump over to my notes. And if you remember, we were able to compromise the scott.wyland user right here. And we set up an SSH backdoor by adding our key to that user's authorized keys file after we made the file, of course. And when we enumerated as Scott Wyland, there's a few things that stood out to me. One is he's in the Ronnie Stone user group, which seems odd, something worth noting. Various Tmux groups and the bank team group. And I think... When we were enumerating the rest of the file system, we saw that bank team group somewhere up here. Yes. So in the opt directory, there was a bank directory and it looks like the bank team group is able to read that. So that's the first thing I want to dig into just because that bank team stood out to me. Then we'll look into the Ronnie Stone connection. And then if we have nothing there, we'll look over into the Tmux connection. Maybe there's like a Tmux session that we can hijack or enter into, but let's go ahead and dive into it. I'll go right back to our terminal. And first I want to CD over to that op directory and I should be able to read that now and I can so when I go to bank we have some interesting things we have a Python server and the start Ronnie Tmux session owned by Ronnie Stone but we're in the Ronnie Stone group so I'd assume we can just run that Okay, no permission denied. Well, if we go to logs, we have nothing in logs. Okay, so some type of connection here, a Tmux server and, and things being set up. Let's just grab that and add it to our notes. Okay, so that's interesting. Let's let's go back to our user's home directory. I don't know if I spend a lot of time looking at our own user's home directory. And actually, there is something that stands out to me here. I want you guys in the live stream, look at this user's home directory. And one thing should stand out to you. If you were doing this for a real world engagement, it would stand out for you. And if you were doing this for like the OSCP, for example, or the PT1, this would all this should stand out to you. Very basic tip when doing Linux enumeration. This is a file you should check. You guys are talking about stakes and I'm trying to teach you about hacking. What is going on? <laughs> Maybe, I don't think we have pseudo permissions. I thought I checked pseudo permissions. Yeah, we don't, because we don't know Scott Wyland's password. It's okay, Humanoi. I'm just kidding. You can talk all about steak that you want. It just cracked me up that when I looked over at chat, I see like <laughs> the ground biscuit out of all things. I love it. But yes, uh, Neffel said bash history. The bash history file, if it's not being nullified or deleted, will actually store the user's command history. We can actually dive. Th actually, 
There's been a few times on a CTF where I've been able to look at dot bash history and the creator of the machine like didn't clean it and it's actually an unintended way to solve a machine. But in the real world and in other CTFs, you might find a command or a password that the user passed on the command line and because we can see the bash history, we can dig into it. So let's go ahead and look at this file. Well, cat bash history and we actually have a lot going on here. So we have Scott going to document and then downloads. He made notes somewhere and, and downloads. I didn't see, well, maybe we should check that. Well, we'll check it later if we don't see anything. But it looks like he went over to downloads, he ran git status, and then he used Vim. And we know that Scott is elite hacker because he was able to exit Vim. So congratulations, Scott Weiland. You're already ahead of most of us. But he used Vim to record notes. Oh, and then we have a SOCAT command here that is actually connecting back to that um, that bank directory we were looking at. That stands out to me. I'm going to say looking at bash history. Let's record if the things that stand out. So we have that that stands out to us. The other thing that stood out to me from it is this notes.txt. He CD to downloads, did get status, and then recorded something in notes.txt. So that might be worth looking into as well. We have him generating some SSH keys. He is sending out some file to a user. He's doing nano on a to-do.txt. He's running Docker. I didn't see anything that had to do with Docker on this machine but that might be worth at least noting down. Maybe we could record it. <laughs> Freaking Cody Crooks. He removed Bank Smarter Backup. He moved the backup to the main one. He's looking at his history file, adding stuff. He, he tried, oh, this is me. This is me trying to do that stuff. Like this is my, these are my commands. A lot of these commands are mine, but not the ones before that. So looking at that, the most promising one to me is probably this one, but let's first check out this downloads. Oh, it's not a directory. Okay, so that probably isn't going to matter. Can we do get status? No. Okay, can we do Docker? No, Docker's not installed. So maybe some rabbit holes there, but we do have this SOCAT command that will potentially give us a session as uh, Ronnie or whatever his name was. If I run that, and I'm right, we now have a session as Ronnie Stone with that SOCAT command. If we do ID, we are in the bank team and the bankers group. So that's a new group that's going to be worth digging into, but we want to get a stable shell. Let's do the same thing we did for Scott Weiland and give ourselves SSH access to Ronnie Stone's account. We'll go over to Ronnie Stone's user folder. Do we have SSH? Oh, we do. And we have, we just have known hosts. I'm going to go ahead and echo literally the same command I ran before. Let me grab my public key right here. And we will echo my public key into authorized keys like so. Also, am I missing anything in my notes? We'll say, um, compromising, I don't remember the user's name, Ronnie Stone. So we ran that command, and then that, of course, gave us access as the Ronnie user. We can kind of grab that to show the exact attack that we ran. And now we should be able to SSH as Ronnie Stone. Bank smarter dot hack smarter. Ooh. We require some password auth, eh? Did I do something wrong? Nope. He must just require password-based authentication. Usually if we can pass it our key, 
it'll work. Uh, make sure it's grabbing our key. Nope. Still wants a password. All right. Well, in that case, let's stabilize our shell a different way. I personally always forget the syntax for stabilizing a shell, but there's this cool, oh, I don't even have it. There is like a hack tools browser extension that has a lot of helpful tools, including uh, shell stabilizing stuff. If you don't have this browser extension, I highly recommend it. It is completely free. It's open source as well, so it's not like malicious. You can go look at the code yourself on GitHub. But let me go and open up hack tools. I like to make this full screen. And I can't do this light mode craziness, so let's go ahead and make it dark. And then over here in hack tools, we can go to TTY spawn shell to stabilize our shell. And you can quite literally script kitty your way through it, just like I do each time I have to do this. First, do we have Python? I should learn how to type Python 3. We do have Python 3, so we should be able to just copy these commands. We'll do that. Export, Control Z, copy. copy. All right, now we have a stable shell. And I'll just grab this for our notes. I'm just gonna maybe grab a screenshot of this. And we'll say stabilized our shell with this method, because SSH required a password. And I will drop it over to the left side. And now we have a stable shell and we can begin enumerating. So we have the new, the newest group that we have here is the bankers group. That's going to be worth digging into. Did I add that to my notes yet? All right. No, but I have, oh man, guys, I'm getting tired. We'll add, we'll add that note right here. And a big, a big, well, oh, now it's going out to my host machine, not my host machine, y'all. A big part about pen testing really is just doing a good job of taking notes. Because as you can imagine, when you're doing a pen test, it's usually scoped for more than one day. Almost always scoped for more than one day. It's not like the OSCP. You'll have five days or 10 days or sometimes even a month to do an engagement. And the better notes that you take, the easier it is for you to pick up on your work on a previous day or to very quickly share your notes with a colleague to have them look over your notes and say, hey, what am I missing here? Do you see any potential things that I overlooked? The better you are at taking notes, the easier it is for your colleague, easier it is for you, and the better quality the, the client's gonna get during the pen test. So let's go ahead and drop that in there. And I'll say is the bankers group. That's the newest one. We also have, but I think that's because of how the SOCAD and TMUX session is set up. That makes sense in this instance. I don't think it would be like us hijacking a TMUX session, but I'm looking over the time. We're almost at 15 minutes. And I think this is a good stopping point for part three of this series because we compromise another user. We stabilized our shell. We began doing some initial enumeration and I wanna pass it back over to you. Before you watch the next part, I want you to try privilege escalation on your own. Can you go from Ronnie Stone to the root user? Do some digging, see what you're able to find out. If you get stuck, that's okay. As usual, you can join me in the next video and we will work through this together.